You go into your shower feeling, but as soon as you reach for the Irish Spring, your day immediately gets better. That crisp, fresh, unmistakable Irish Spring scent zings your brain and awakens your senses. So when you finally emerge from the shower, 37 minutes later, because you pay the water bill so you can stay in there as long as you want, you're ready to take on the day and smell great doing it. Irish Spring Body Wash and Bar Soap. Fresh, green, Irish. Shop now at Walmart. Thursday night football is on, and it's only on Prime Video. Breaking tackles. This week, the Minnesota Vikings head west to take on the Los Angeles Rams. This is what you love to see. Coverage begins with football's best party on TNF tonight. Not a Prime member? Sign up for a 30-day free trial to stream the game. It's the Vikings and the Rams, Thursday only on Prime Video. Restrictions apply. See Amazon.com slash Amazon Prime for details. It's time for a Big Blue Kickoff Live. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Prime. And the Giants mobile app. 17-14 is the final. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. Welcome to Friday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live here on Giants.com. It's presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football Giants. We'll be here for the next hour to talk Giants football with you and Sunday's matchup at MetLife Stadium against the NFC East division rival Philadelphia Eagles as they bring Saquon Barkley back to the Meadowlands. I'm Paul Dottino, has Matt Sytek. Yes, both New York baseball teams lost last night. He's cranky, didn't get much sleep. I'm cranky, I didn't get much sleep. So our patience is not going to be as long as the turnpike. (laughs) It's going to be pretty much from here to the toll plaza right outside at 16W. So please, call up with really good questions, good comments, and good information. Whatever you do... Don't call up and just start spouting stats, especially from some mumbo-jumbo place that you got it from off the internet, because that won't fly. 201-939-4513 is our phone number, again, to talk New York Giants football. And this show, if you're not listening to it live, can be caught along with our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcasts. All right, first up, Injury information, roster information. I'll let you handle the roster. You probably posted it, correct? I did, yes. Why don't you go for it? Okay, so Coach Dable announced this morning that the Giants signed in an offensive tackle, Chris Hubbard, off of the San Francisco 49ers practice squad. Uh, Chris Hubbard has been around for a long time now. A decade. He's a, yeah, he's been around the, for a decade. He... Uh, Played four seasons with the Steelers, a few five seasons with the Browns, one with the Titans. Uh, has played exactly 100 games, 58 starts, almost all of which were at right tackle. So, yeah, I mean, Andrew Thomas got put on IR earlier this week. We knew that they were going to fill the roster spot with someone, and it seemed like, obviously, an offensive tackle was the most logical choice there. And they brought someone in, a veteran, Another veteran, you know, to join this already very veteran offensive line uh, who has plenty of experience. Uh, You know, coach said that probably this Sunday would be a little too early to expect much or anything from Hubbard. But I don't think he's going to get a jersey this week. Probably not. I mean, again, they signed him this morning to have a turnaround of two days and then have him active. You know, Mm -hmm. might be a little too much, but, you know... Depending on how the offensive line looks this week, you know, maybe he gets into the mix in the future. We don't know. But for now, Chris Hubbard signed off the 49ers practice squad, just adding another veteran to the group. Hubbard um, has played mostly a tackle, but he also has some experience at guard. And uh, when he was earlier in his career, he did a lot of practice stuff at center. He's undersized. That's the key to remember about him. He's a technician, very smart player. Heck, I wanted the Giants to go after him after his days in Pittsburgh. He became a free agent. I was lobbying for the Giants to sign him then because I thought he would be a good budget value. He has, again, versatility. He can do multiple positions. 
But you're talking about a guy who's a tad under 300 pounds. I think when he checks in here, we'll find out exactly what they weigh him at. But for most of his career, he's played at under 300. He's six foot three, uh, only has like 31 inch arms, which is why he's not really suited, to be frank with you, to be a tackle. But out of necessity over his career, he's been in positions where they needed him to do it. And he was capable at least to do an adequate job. And that's why he was thrown out there quite a bit in his career. He's played most of his snaps as a tackle because of that. Yeah, almost all of his snaps have been at right tackle. He has a few starts at, uh, I believe it was right guard. Yeah, right guard. And three as an extra lineman. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, most of his snaps have come at right tackle. He started nine games for the Titans last year. So it's not like this guy has been, you know, like a, a journeyman that hasn't really played much lately. The guy started more than half the season last year, uh, gave up four sacks, 18 pressures in those nine games. Again, like decent. Not... He's here for his experience. Yes, for 100%. Uh, and Coach Dable mentioned that uh, Tim Kelly, the, yes. the Giants tight ends coach, came from the tight ends, had experience with Chris Hubbard last year, and I think that familiarity was a reason why they targeted Hubbard with this extra roster spot. I'm sure Coach Bowen knows him too. Yes, definitely. Okay, also, as far as practice goes, uh, yes, Malik Neighbors is out of protocol. We do believe he'll be meeting the media later on today after practice. He's out there right now as we speak. Dexter Lawrence is out there as we speak. Brian Burns is out there as we speak. Devin Singletary is out there as we speak. But Dane Belton came down with an illness. Uh, not feeling so good, so he's not practicing today. We don't know how long that will last. It could be one of those 24-hour deals. You never know. So uh, that remains to be seen as we uh, progress towards kickoff on Sunday. Also, Jamie Gillen uh, has definitely been ruled out. As you guys know, um, Hawk was brought in last week to punt and to hold. He's going to have to have it, the duties again for at least another week. Yeah, so Gillen was the only player that Coach Dable fully ruled out for Sunday's game. Mm -hmm. Uh, He wouldn't go so far as to guarantee that Dexter Lawrence or Brian Burns would play. Uh, Obviously, them being able to get back on the practice field today after missing Wednesday and Thursday, it's as Coach said, it's better than the alternative. It's better than them not being able to practice all week. Did you Uh, hear those guys talk this week? Yes, both of them on Wednesday (laughs) straight up said directly, we are are playing. (laughs) Obviously... It doesn't always come down to what the player wants. You know, sometimes the coaching mm-hmm. staff, the training staff have to hold guys back if they're not, if they're too banged up. But the two of them being out there today, obviously, it is a good sign. We'll have to see. I wouldn't be surprised if one or both of them get a questionable tag on the final injury report today. Sure. But we'll have to see. But in good news or better news, coach said that Devin Singletary should be good to go for Sunday. So he has missed the last two games. Obviously, Tyrone Tracy has stepped up and played pretty well in his absence. It looks like we're finally going to get to see the two of them together mm-hmm. in, with some sort of workload split. Coach said that Tyrone Tracy has earned himself more playing time with yes. the way he's played the last two weeks. Yes, Devin Singletary is not just going to fade away, though. He is a, a very solid veteran running back. He's that, the best patch, <clears throat> press protector in the running back hundred percent. There's a reason why Coach Dable... And Joe Shane decided to target him this offseason to bring him in. He's not just going to go away. He's still going to get playing time. And Dable said that Eric Gray should see the field as well. Mm -hmm. We'll see how many opportunities each of those guys get. But I'm excited to see this rushing attack sort of at full strength. I mean, I don't know if Devin Singletary is necessarily exactly at 100% yet. But if he's good to go, that's good enough for me. I'm excited to see sort of this new... I don't want to say a new look backfield because they did play the first few games together, but this backfield with Tracy playing a little bit more and now Devin Singletary back in the fold. Tracy becomes even more important against this opponent because the Eagles are soft against the run around the edges. That's a big deal. Singletary is a much more between the tackles runner. Tracy's quickness, his uh, fleet of foot, his jukeability, he's better on the edges and getting to the sideline. That's where the Eagles have been the weakest in terms of their rushing defense off of both edges. So I think Tracy is absolutely going to get some work on Sunday. Yeah. And probably even more touches than Singletary will.
Yeah, you're right that he is good on the outside rushes, but he's also had success on the inside rushes. He has. I. But if you're going to run inside, they'll probably let Singletary have those. True, but I do have a, a next-gen stat here that the Giants have averaged 5.2 yards per carry on 38 inside rushes mm -hmm. with Tracy on the field and 3.5 yards per carry on 55 inside rushes with Tracy off the field. So Tracy has had success no running doubt. inside, but to your point, the Eagles, they are pretty strong on the interior. You know, Jalen Carter may, be, may not be having quite as good of a season as the Eagles would have hoped, but he's still a very solid defensive tackle. Teams are not not really testing them that too often on inside rushes. 34.5% of design runs against the Eagles defense have been inside, and that's the third lowest rate in the NFL. So teams have been attacking them more on the edges on the outside than they have on the inside. So, And you know why? Sweat, Huff, and Brandon Graham, when he comes into the rotation, those are edge players. They got their tongues out salivating to get to the quarterback. And as we talk about time and time again, some of these pass rushers, some of these edge rusher guys are so concerned with getting to the quarterback, they kind of half-ass it against the run. And that's what happens. You know, Simeon Rice was the poster child for that. You don't remember Simeon Rice, do you? No, I do. Okay, Simeon Rice for the Bucks, Outstanding pass rusher. I think he had just about 100 sacks in his career. Totally one-dimensional player. Mark Astonow of the Jets, another guy like that. Strictly would sell out. Every play, he's thinking, I'm going to rush the quarterback and would sell out and not defend the run. That's why teams run at the edges of the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah, and they've had success running. As you said, they've had success running on the edges. The Eagles' total yardage allowed on the ground ranks 16th, but that's just because they haven't had teams attempting too many runs. They have ranked 13th in terms of rushing attempts on them. When it comes to yards per carry allowed, which honestly is the most important stat there is in terms of these metrics, they rank 25th, 4.8 yards per carry. That is not good. So teams have had success running on the outside against the Eagles, and I expect the Giants to do it. Plenty of that come Sunday. All right, so 201-939. 4513. Again, we'll have locker room access a bit later on, but we did get to talk to some of the assistants earlier this morning. I think the one assistant coach that that did say something of uh of reinforcement uh compared to what Brian Dable said the other day would be Carmen Brasillo, the offensive line coach, who reiterated his belief, and it echoes what Coach Dable said, when you have to make a change on your offensive line. You absolutely prefer to swap out one guy for one guy and not make multiple changes. It's the reason that Dable said he leaned towards, you know, going with Azudu. Not that he was in any way grading Azudu's play or, or Neil's play because he says he's been happy with both guys at practice. But he did say you always lean towards making the fewest changes you can. So they're only subbing out the left tackle. They're not flipping Illuminor to the other side. He's given him some reps there as a precaution. He said it again today. Most of the left tackle reps have gone to Wazudu. Illuminor has had some. Neil has been at right tackle. And that's just the way the Giants are going to play it. Doesn't mean they can't switch it up if it doesn't go well and something forces them into going to plan B. But Carmen Brasillo said the same thing about, hey, if you can make one change, make one change. Don't flop things around. Yeah, I mean, look, the line has had success this year. They haven't been yeah. perfect, but we've seen such a stark improvement from last year, and it's because of all these veterans that they added, all of which, not all of which, Runyon's the left guard, but a big part of it has been, you know, the Van roden Illuminor combo on the right side. So, yeah, it's... It's easier just to replace one guy than to start shuffling multiple guys around when the unit has had success. Now, if the unit has been struggling, maybe that would be a different story. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to mess with what's working. Obviously, the loss of Andrew Thomas is big, but the other four guys have still you know, been playing pretty well. So you want to keep that chemistry with those four in the same spots. I would say that it's certainly trending towards Azudu starting at left tackle, yes. Illuminor at right. 
But the way it kind of it sounds like the situation might be that, you know, if something were to happen in game to Azudu and he would have to leave, then they might spring to this backup plan of Illuminor moving to the left side and Evan Neal stepping in at right tackle. We don't know this for sure. It just seems to be the, the I guess the vibes that have been given out by you know coach with what he said with and Carmen Brasillo as well. Obviously, hopefully we don't have to even find out if that is the backup plan because we we don't want to see any more offensive linemen go down with injuries. <laughs> Please. Uh but yeah, Please. so that it seems like the O line alignment is trending in that direction for Sunday's game, as you mentioned, Paul. That doesn't mean that that the, if that ends up being the starting five with a Zudu at left tackle, Illuminor to right that doesn't mean it's set in stone for the rest of the season. They might try might that. Not, might not even be that way in the fourth quarter. Exactly. You it might not even know. last all game, but <laughs> it, they're going to trot it out to start. If it works, then that's great. I'm sure they'll continue to roll with it. And if it doesn't, you know, it might be in-game adjustments. It might be next week, but it is still, you know, all options are certainly on the table and that's going to go beyond just this week as well. Are you a morning person? Or when you roll out of bed, do you literally roll out of bed? Mm. Listen, mornings can be hard to handle. From the moment you open your eyes, your responsibilities and to-dos start piling up in your head. But you know what helps? Yep, a shower. But not just any shower, a shower with Irish Spring. Yeah, as soon as you reach for the Irish Spring, your day immediately gets better. All those to-dos are totally doable. Because that crisp fresh, unmistakable Irish spring scent zings your brain and awakens your senses. So when you finally emerge from that glorious shower, 37 minutes later, because let's be honest, you pay the water bill so you can stay in there as long as you want. You're ready to take on the day. And smell great doing it. Irish spring body wash and bar soap. Fresh, green, Irish. Look for Irish spring in the soap aisle at Walmart. Final thoughts from Brasillo. He said that Neil lost so much time because of the surgery on the ankle and being on PUP at the start of training camp. He was way behind by the time they started to get to work with him. And so consequently, even though they're very pleased with his progress, they are isolating him at right tackle. He said, I know he played some left tackle at Alabama. I get that. But they're isolating him at right tackle, wanting him just to focus on that one position They seemed pleased with his progress, but again, he was way behind the eight ball. By the time Brasillo got here in the spring, Neil Neil couldn't do anything. He had ankle surgery. And he he was trying to tell one of the writers earlier today, he's like, okay, think about this. He couldn't do anything over the spring, couldn't do anything over the summer. We get to camp, he's on PUP. He's like, by the time we can actually get him on the field and start working with him, we had a preseason game against Houston, right? You remember that? Yep. Then the preseason game with the Jets, right? With Houston and the Jets? Yeah, that's the way it went. Yes. And he said, but now the real season starts. Real speed. Different story. So now we got to work with them in live action under regular season conditions. And guess what? Now we don't have the luxury to do that because we've already set our offensive line. So now Neil's got to work in practice. So he he was really caught behind the eight ball. That's the explanation that Priscillo, Priscillo gave us about Neil. In terms of Azudu, um, very versatile player. He goes, it's his third year, and we always say third year is where a guy has to really break out of his shell and show what he's got. So he's like, this is it. It's his third year. Let's throw him in there. Let's see what he's got. He said, um, sometimes with these versatile guys, you never know what position he's going to be best at. Sometimes you know right away. Sometimes you don't know right away. He said he doesn't know if tackle is Azudu's best position. He flat out said it. But he said he does have the skills to play it. And that's why they decided to work him there. He didn't mention the depth issue, but I think we've discussed that before. The Giants had more people on the interior line than on the out uh, exterior, yeah. especially with Neil Hurt in the offseason, so it made sense for them to give him work at tackle. He did say Izzuto's improvement has been, he says he's worked his butt off, his power and his balance were the two traits that Priscillo isolated 
as the most improved facets of his game as he prepares for what is likely going to be a start against Philadelphia. So let's go to the phones. 201-939-4513. Again, the Giants and Eagles coming up on Sunday at 1 o'clock. I tell you what, how many times can you remember, Matt? And I, I, I haven't gone back into the old schedules. Sunday at 1. Giants-Philly a lot of times gets the doubleheader game. We've even seen it sometimes on prime time. Sunday at 1. Kind of a kind of a different change up for us. Yeah, it definitely is, but I for one am happy about it because uh, the You la- see me complaining. The last two home games for the Giants have both been night games and while primetime games are, you know, always awesome, great energy, you know, the lights, the light show, the light bands that we've been doing. You know, the there's games, another one in Pittsburgh next week. <laughs> they're all great. But for those of us that are working, like I didn't get home on Sunday night till about two in the morning. So Yes, a 1 o'clock kickoff I'm very much welcoming this week. All right, let's go to the phones. And Big Ed from Maryland is first on the program. Hello, Big Ed. How are you? Hey, Big Paul Lee. How you doing? It's just another day, my friend. we got to keep turning the wheel, turning the wheel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, keys for the victory. Pressure from the D-line is key. It seems obvious. So any shorts, we should be stacking them. But most importantly, gap control, because Saquon knows us very well. That's a key important thing. Got to have gap control. Mm -hmm. Because when you have that gap control, you can control that run. They will not be able to run all over you because one little squeak, he's gone. We all know it because we've seen him do it. But we got to have that gap control. That is so important. As far as the offense side of the ball, I've been thinking, since we got neighbors back, hmm, we might be going deep quite a bit, Nick. <laughs> what do you think, Paul? Eh? What do you think, Mr. Paul? Eh? <laughs> Big Ed, you sound really excited about it. <laughs> look, look, Quinion Mitchell, the fellow first-round draft pick out of Toledo, has been starting for the Eagles at right corner, which means he draws the X receiver. So Mitchell is going to draw neighbors most of the time. Giants are going to move neighbors around, of course, as we know. Definitely. But, but he'll draw him most of the time. Now, Mitchell's had six passes defensed, which is top ten in the NFL. It leads the Eagles. Hasn't given up a touchdown pass this year. But here's the interesting number. He's given up 15 yards a catch. That's, okay. that's a lot of yardage. So, yes. Do I think that neighbors can do some business on him? I do. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, <laughs> let's look at the first four week games of the season with how many targets Malik Neighbors was getting. The fact that he's now healthy and hopefully, you know, groin, this groin injury. Coach said that, you know, as long as he doesn't have a setback today, that he should be good to go for Sunday. I fully right. expect them to feed the ball to Malik. You know, it may not be the 16 or so targets that we saw a couple of times at the beginning of the season, right. but... He's going to get the ball, and he's going to get the ball a lot. Like, it wouldn't shock me to see 10 or 10 or so, 10 or more targets for Malik Neighbors. He's the Giants' best weapon. Quinion Mitchell, he has gotten his career off to a strong start. He's a very solid player. You know, we were high on him going into the draft. But on that matchup, if it's Malik Neighbors versus Quinion Mitchell one-on-one, I will take my chances on Malik any day of the week. I'll tell you what, Big Ed, you know, Slay, yeah. Slay's a bit dinged up, too. He's got a knee. He didn't practice yesterday, Darius Slay, who okay. I believe has lost half a step. Now, okay, then now. Okay, the reason for Hyatt. Yeah, now, that if he, well, to be frank with you. That's what I've been thinking about, too. I wanted to make sure I said that. Well, it could be, it could be Slayton, like, too. Don't don't ball. cheat Slayton now. Slayton, Slayton has no, had some good, good games against now, Philadelphia. If he's hurt a little bit, we, we got another, we got two, three others that can step in his place. We just have to know where he stands when it's time for kickoff. Right. It, will he be able to go to full distance or not? Well, he's out there today. So we will oh, okay, see. So Ke- okay. Keely, Ring- uh, Keely Ringo no. would be the backup to Slay in all likelihood if Slay can't. Okay. can't and develop. and just just to just to note that the first two days the first two days of practice on the injury report, Darius Slayton has been limited with a groin injury. So just right. you know just something to keep an eye on. I have no indication that you know it could keep him out or Sunday. We have no idea one way or the other. But just obviously. 
guy limited on the practice report, just something to keep an eye on. Right. So, look, on a growing injury, let him take his time back a little bit because we're going to need him in these next few runs, you know, in the next month or so coming and and then for the later time. So, right now, if it can just be limited, fine. I mean, if he's fine, fine, go. But if not, make sure you, you know, don't go. Because we need these other guys now to step up a little bit. We need to get Hyatt more in the game. You know, he needs to get his catches up. Wandell needs to get something more up. He's been active, but we need to get him up a little bit more. But definitely not sleep on this running game. And then don't start somebody. And then I had this other thing too, Paul Hamilton, go, because I don't want to take up everybody's time. It's Friday. Um, who was the last quarterback that we had that beat the Eagles? Who was that guy? Tyrod Taylor. Last year, yeah. Okay, who was that before him? Well, the Giants have won three of the last four meetings against Philadelphia here at MetLife Stadium. Great. So who was so, the last quarterback before, before Tyrod? I believe, I believe Daniel's beaten them. Okay, so Daniel knows what he needs to now focus on. Beating the Eagles particularly is simply clock management and throw the crap out the deep ball. Hey, man, I also remember this thing where you have one receiver go short, one go medium, and one go deep. Mm-hmm. If neighbors go deep. That, that's a standard That's a neighbors. standard pass route tree, Big Ed. There's nothing unique about right. that. Right. But see, here's the thing. It's almost like that's just a key word for the, for the game, decoy. <laughs> Because I, I love I love your confidence and your assertiveness. He's got it all planned out, man. You, you got us winning by two touchdowns. What's the deal? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah, at least two. We got to throw the deep ball, man. He got to throw the deep ball, especially coming out in the second half. Throw that dag on deep ball. Make sure we stay keeping things going uh, at least some type of decent way. Oh yeah, I hope the kicker's been making practice because that was tough last week okay see that's the problem big ed the giants have been in position to score a lot more points than they have this year and they've either had drop passes sabotage their chances or a missed field goal sabotage their chances you can't have that stuff happening on sunday and expect to win the game right you're right so it's all about it so simple we play the eagles like we play the eagles that's it. Knock him upside the head. Knock him upside the head. Let him know it's real. <laughs> and um, all right, Big Ed. I want. I want to try to get some you. other people. We're still on a one line deal here. Hey, look, say Saquon, we love you, but <laughs> Big Ed says we love you, man. But you wearing green, and you talking about fly eagle fly, and you better look at that blue that's flying all over you. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we say good day. Thanks, Big Ed. You almost sounded like the Joker. <laughs> I uh, just wanted to point one thing out that Big Ed said about, you know, oh. taking some shots down the field. Uh, Malik Neighbors, obviously, this should come as much of a surprise, but Malik Neighbors, despite missing two the last two games, still leads the team in targets that 10 or more air yards down the field. Now, 10 air yards, obviously, that's not a deep shot. He's only allowed, but averaging 11 yards a catch. Yeah. I'm just, that's pretty low. It is, but I'm just saying, obviously, 10, yard, 10, 10 air yards, that's not a deep shot, but at least, you know, it's to the sticks or beyond the sticks. So he does lead the team in those targets. So with him, you know, obviously, hopefully being back on Sunday, maybe that will help give Daniel Jones a little boost in those throws beyond the sticks. I mean, it certainly can't hurt. How about he just averages 15 yards a catch? I'd be okay with that. Yeah, I mean, that would be great. (laughs) That would be fantastic. You know? 201-939-4513. One thing to keep in mind, Big Ed, about the Giants passing attack against Philadelphia. Avante Maddox has been benched. He did not play against Cleveland last week. The Eagles have given up five touchdown passes to slot receivers this year, tied for third most in the league. Avante Maddox had been let go after last year. They brought him back on a one-year contract, and he has not played well. 
So they've gone to uh, the rookie out of Iowa, second round pick Cooper DeJean. 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 Is it DeJean? Yep. He um he was primarily thought of out of the combine as a safety who could play corner, had corner skills. He wound up playing most of the game against Cleveland last week. Had half a sack, six tackles. But here's the thing. He played almost the whole game. And he only had four targets thrown at him. The Cleveland Browns, for some strange reason, decided not to attack him. I'm sorry, but that would have been the first place I went in my passing game. This kid, second-round pick, primarily a safety being asked to play slot corner, I would have attacked him as much as I possibly could have. And from what I understand, it was four targets, two completes for 13 yards. They they basically let him, like, coast into the job. If I'm the Giants, Wondell Robinson is going to be doing business against him all day long. Yeah, the only thing I'll say to that is you make a very good point. I think the only thing is that you're talking about the Cleveland Browns passing attack, which obviously right now is probably the worst passing attack in the entire NFL. You know, Deshaun Watson is certainly playing among all the the more reason why they should have attacked the kid. I just think that that offense is completely broken and Deshaun Watson isn't really. That's why they're the Cleveland Browns, right? right? That's why they're the Cleveland Browns. That's yeah. Okay. This team is not the Cleveland Browns. This team beat the Cleveland Browns. Wondell Robinson, who right now is probably, I'm going to say, at least one of the top five slot receivers in the National Football League. Forget what the stats say. I think he's one of the top five. He needs to do business against this kid. Well, yeah, obviously, Wondell, very talented wide receiver and also has 58 targets through six games. So I fully expect, despite Malik Neighbors being back, I fully expect him to get more than, you know, the four targets that Cooper DeGene faced last week in the slot. If he's matched up with Wondell Robinson on most passing routes that Wondell runs, I fully expect that number to be a lot higher than four, just based on what we've seen from Wandell all season. Exactly. And I, yeah, I'm with you. I expect if it's double digits. I expect Wandell to take advantage of that matchup. I mean, I do. He has to. I did like Cooper DeGene coming into the draft. I think he is a talented player, but he's still very raw. And as you said, a lot of people thought he might be potentially better suited at safety than slot corner. Wandell is just one of the most elusive wide receivers and difficult to tackle. You know, you mentioned that uh, Cooper DeGene was only targeted four times. He gave up two receptions. I think it was for 14 yards, but 11 of those 14 yards were after the catch. And we know Wandell is pretty good with the ball in his hands mm-hmm. and with, with the yards after the catch. So mm-hmm. I, I'm with you. I think this could be a big game for Wandell. All right. We go back to the phones. And Ryan from Illinois, you're next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. Hey, guys. How are we doing today? What's going on? Good. The offensive struggles and maybe how it's um, – let me see, how do I put this? Uh, I feel like when we were going into the Dallas game and the Cincinnati game, everyone was talking about how bad those defenses were and just how this should be an opportunity for mm-hmm. the offense to really get going. However, I do want to say I think both of those teams' defenses were nationally criticized so badly. They galvanized themselves and then had a great game against us. Uh, can we just get a normal defense, not get a national <laughs> shame? I would love to not have, um, you know, the Eagles feel like they need to come out. And I don't know, man. I just feel like both the Cowboys and the Bengals made a statement against us defensively. And I would just love a very average, middle-of-the-road Eagles performance on defense, please. <laughs> no, you're, Look, you're not wrong at all. Obviously, we spoke a lot about this last week heading into the Bengals game. The Bengals held a players-only meeting prior to the game, and it was focused pretty much squarely on the defensive struggles. The Cowboys, going into the Week 4 game, had given up, in the two previous weeks, 44 points to the Saints and 28 points to the Ravens. And you're right, there was a lot of talk, oh, Micah Parsons, Demarcus Lawrence, where is the production from this defense? So you're right, going into those two games, the national media was pretty much lighting a fire 
underneath both of those teams' defenses. Mm -hmm. That isn't really the case this week. The Eagles are coming off a game where it was more of the offense, honestly, struggling because the offense only scored 20 points last week against the Browns. Defense held them to 16 points. So that storyline that you talked about, that's not there this week. So I'm with you. Hopefully we face a defense that I guess is maybe not – the same or quite as motivated as the Bengals and the Cowboys leading up to the game. Yeah, I think just once pride gets on the line and guys look each other in the eyes and say, I'm doing this for your family, you're doing it for mine, it just changes the ball game, you know? No one wants to lose their job for giving up 45 points. And so, you know, they got they just buckled up and suddenly we're facing a defense that says, no, we're not gonna we're not gonna give in anymore. So I'm looking forward to hopefully an Eagles defense that, you know, we can catch them um, backpedaling a little bit, get the run game going. And honestly, you know, if, if Mike Danvers gets 16 targets, okay, well, we're 2-4. and four. We need our best player to get the ball. Hopefully he can have 150 yards and uh, really, really tear them up. And then that will open up Theo Johnson. That will open up Tyrone Tracy on screens, all this good stuff. And the little things that we're working on in the offseason, it really comes together when you have that centerpiece. And I'll, I'll take some, you know, uh, comments off the air. Thanks, guys. Well, you know, if the Giants play as they did in Seattle a couple of weeks ago, there's no reason to believe that they won't win this game. The performance they put on the field in Seattle was uh, was really, really good in a lot of ways. Now, what did they do last week? <laughs> it, was, it was just, they lost two-thirds of the game. I thought even though they gave up a couple in plays they'd like to have back on defense. I was okay with that part of the game. I thought the special teams failed, and I thought the offense failed. And when you lose two out of the three units, you're probably going to lose. Yeah, and even despite what you just said, which is accurate, the Giants were right there in the game till the very end. I know. Like, as we talked about earlier in the week, like, a fumble ball the, out of bounds not saying with the about Giants, two minutes to go might have changed the whole deal. Yeah, and I'm not saying that the Giants should have won the game, but it was a winnable game. Yes. It was there for the taking. It kind of fell through the fingertips, which unfortunately happens sometimes. But obviously you hope, you hope that the sort of motivation narrative that we just talked about with the Cowboys and Bengals going into those games, hopefully that's at, directed towards the Giants going into this week, especially on offense, because it's similar to that, actually, the narrative, just because talked about the Bengals and the Cowboys, the Seahawks defense was facing that same exact narrative going into our game, because the week before we played the Seahawks, they gave up 42 points to the Detroit Lions on Monday Night Football in front of the whole country. They had six defensive starters injured, yes, though. They, they were did. badly hurt going into that game. For sure, but a lot of those guys... Oh, the Lions game, you're saying? Yes. Yeah, but a lot then, of those, almost all those guys came back for and the game I against the Giants. And the Giants still played an extremely good game on offense and obviously won the game. I want to say four of the six came back against the Giants. Four or five of them, yeah. Not everyone, but you know, almost all of them came back. And the Giants offense still went out there and had probably their best overall performance of the season. The offensive line certainly did. Yeah, so... Despite that narrative, like the Giants offense has shown that that's not like a fired up defense isn't enough to stop them. Yeah, well, I'll tell you who's going to be fired up is going to be Barkley. He'll be the most fired See, up player on the team. That's the thing. I don't want to say that worries me, but I think everyone on that Philadelphia Eagles team in that locker room knows, despite the fact that Saquon hasn't been saying it to the media, no one's been saying it, but this game obviously holds a ton of meaning for Saquon. His first game back at MetLife. With everything that's been said, you know, online, by media, like everyone, he's clearly going to come up fired up for this game. And you know that his teammates are going to come in and wanting to win this game for him in his return. That is the, you know, the little motivation narrative that concerns me a little bit. But on the flip side, if the Giants perform the way that we've seen them do at times, on the three sides of the ball, I don't care how motivated or fired up Saquon and the Eagles come into the stadium. The Giants can handle the business then. The Giants can take care of business and come out with the win if they just focus on themselves and do what they need to do to win the game.
I will mention one small item about Saquon Barkley. I have great respect for him as a player and as a talent. There's no question about that. One thing that we saw when he was here, and I know that the Eagles line, and it has been statistically proven, has given him better blocking than the Giants ever did. I believe I saw the next-gen stat said he's got two yards per carry before he's touched, which is the best of his career. No surprise. Philadelphia's line has been habitually better than the Giants' offensive line. Okay. But here's what we always noticed about Saquon Barkley, and even even guys like myself who were very big supporters of his talent. We noticed, and it's true, when Barkley would get so souped up, sometimes he would hesitate. Some of it was because he didn't trust the line and could not be assertive because he wasn't confident that the hole was going to be there, that the play was going to be blocked the way it was supposed to. I still believe that had a tremendous impact on his time while he was here and why he did not do better and run more downhill because he didn't trust the line. They gave him no reason to, Matt. To be fair, they just didn't. Yeah, no, look, okay, you're not wrong. So, but here's what I will say. To those detractors of Barkley who would say that there were times that he would do a little too much dancing and he would be looking for the big play. Heck, he even admitted to us many times over his Giants career that he wanted the big play. He wanted to take it to the house. He wasn't going to settle for the four dirty yards. He wanted the big one. And so he would make extra moves trying to see if he could slice and dice his way through an opening to get the big one. He's going to be doing that Sunday. I'm telling you that right now. He is so souped up to play the Giants. He's going to want to take a 40, 50, 60 yarder to the house and quiet this stadium. He's not going to be happy settling for 25 carries and getting three and four and five yards. That's not what he wants to do. Saquon Barkley is going to want to make splash runs in this building, which means that the Giants defenders not only must have great gap control, they must be disciplined enough to force him into juking himself into leaving yards on the field, which we saw him do while he was here. Yeah, you honestly took the thought right out of my head. I was going to say, Saquon, obviously, when he was a New York Giant, did so much good, you know, so much production on the field. But the one thing that tended to be the the knock on him year in and year out was that he was always looking for that home run play. And he was fully capable of taking a run that most running backs would only be able to get four or five yards and finding a way to bust it out for a 60-yard touchdown run. That is one of the things that makes Saquon Barkley such a great running back. Mm-hmm. So you are 100% right. There's no doubt in my mind that, yeah, he obviously wants to come in and have a good game. He wants to win, find the end zone. But he's not going to be – I mean, he, I'm sure he would settle for, like, a you know, a, a one-yard touchdown run. It wouldn't surprise me if the Eagles get down to the one-yard line and at least attempt first to, to give the ball to Saquon to score instead of the normal tush push. That wouldn't surprise me. But Saquon definitely wants to bust one of those big touchdown runs, as you said, to quiet the crowd. Because despite what Saquon <laughs> said a little bit earlier in the week, I don't know if he's going to get the best reaction from the fan base in his return. And it's squarely because of the jersey he now wears. I mean, the, Gi- <laughs> the Giants boo e- pretty much any Eagle player. Anyone on <laughs> there. The Giants, one of the Giants' biggest rivals. So... Let, let, let he me... will definitely be looking for that big play to sort of hush the crowd. And you're right. The, the defense needs to be prepared for him to try to make that play, which I'm sure they will be. And there were a number of times when Gi- the Giants went up against a team who basically said, you know what? We're not letting him beat us because he's the one headache player on the team. Now, the Giants have to worry about Smith and Brown. Goddard's not playing. He's got a bad hamstring. He's out. That's a big deal. Okay. Are you a morning person? Or when you roll out of bed, do you literally roll out of bed? Mm. Listen, mornings can be hard to handle. From the moment you open your eyes, your responsibilities and to do's start piling up in your head. But you know what helps? Yep, a shower. But not just any shower, a shower with Irish Spring. Yeah, as soon as you reach for the Irish Spring, your day immediately gets better. Oh, yeah. All those to-dos are totally doable. Because that crisp, 
fresh, unmistakable Irish spring scent zings your brain and awakens your senses. So when you finally emerge from that glorious shower, 37 minutes later, because let's be honest, you pay the water bill so you can stay in there as long as you want. You're ready to take on the day. And smell great doing it. Irish Spring Body Wash and Bar Soap. Fresh, green, Irish. Look for Irish Spring in the soap aisle at Walmart. But let me give you a number. Saquon Barkley has played 79 regular season games during his career. Did you know that in 27 of those games, he's rushed for 50 yards or less? Think about that. Just think about that. 27 times, 50 yards or less, out of a 79-game career so far. It's the counter-argument would be, well, to look at the offensive lines he was running behind, though. Some of that was offensive lines, as we discussed, and some of that was teams focusing on him and For making sure. sure they were going to take him away. And then some of that was him being too jacked up about trying to go to this, the, this, the, the, the distance. I'll let me spit that out for you. <laughs> so three factors, three factors that resulted in 27 games of 50 yards or less. This guy is a primo running back. But to have that many, I would say, it's fair to say that's a pedestrian game, 50 yards or less. That's a pedestrian game. Unless it's on like six carries. Yeah. You know, um, and <laughs> most know. of them were double-digit carries. Yep, I know, I know. So, I so if you want to keep something in the back of your head as you're watching this game, if it goes this way, don't be shocked. There is some precedent for it. That's all I'm saying. I will say, though, that so far the season in five games, he is averaging 5.3 yards per carry. Uh, which and is, over 95 yards rushing a Which game. is the 5.3 yards per carry is the most of his career. I so, is, so is the 96.4 rushing yards per game. The 5.3 is 10th in the NFL right now. Yeah, and those are pretty sizable you know, differences, improvements from his best season mm-hmm. with the Giants. He's had two 100-yard games this season. Yeah, out of at, five. Out of five. It's pretty good. Last week against the Browns was his first, I would say, dud game as an Eagle. Outside of that, he's, he's just been great. I mean, he had – I mentioned this with John yesterday. Two of his games so far this season, he's averaged over eight yards per carry. That's insane. Mm-hmm. That is ridiculous. The and, dude is an incredible talent. Yeah. You know, he's an incredible talent. Now, Jordan Mailata, the left tackle, is out. Yep. That is a big blow. He's got a hamstring issue. So it's going to be Fred Johnson, who is a journeyman, six-year pro. He is a swing player, guard, tackle, swing player. He, in all likelihood, is going to be the starting left tackle in this game. If I'm the Eagles, uh, I'm running it to the right side behind Johnson. (laughs) I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, uh, uh, you know. I'm I'm not I'm not running it the other way, um, because Lane, Lane is still healthy and playing. Uh, Cam Jurgens, the former right guard, has moved into center with Jason Kelsey's retirement, and oh by the way, on runs directly behind center up the middle, the Philadelphia Eagles rank 26th in the NFL, averaging a little over three and a half yards a carry. They're not doing well running behind Jurgens. You know why? He's a bit of an undersized center. And he's going up against the big man, Dexter Lawrence. We've seen what Dexter can do against undersized okay. centers. Just you know what that means? To, look back to week one. Barkley, if you're the Eagles and you're not running it left and you're not running it up the middle, you're running it behind Lane Johnson, multiple Pro Bowl offensive tackle, who is probably going to be dealing with the Zizo Jolari most of the game. If the Giants line Aziz up where he primarily lined up this past week, then yeah. Which would put- Just more details. That's why I told you. You want to cut a promo with this, you can't. There are thousands of storylines in this game. Which, thousands of them. Which, as I mentioned yesterday, if Aziz does line up on that side and facing Lane Johnson most of the game, that would mean, assuming he plays and is healthy, Brian Burns would be facing a whole lot of Fred Johnson, which I will take that matchup. So <laughs> will I. I have one other note, just to very real quick flip it. Back to the other side of the ball very quickly. I forgot to mention this earlier. Uh, in terms of, you know, the situation at left tackle, 
whoever it might be, looks like it could be Azuda, but whoever it might be, coming into this game, Chris Manhurts and Theo Johnson rank second and third among tight ends in the NFL in pass blocking snaps on the season. I fully expect that trend to continue. Mm-hmm. They will probably be giving whoever it is at left tackle a lot of help. You might even see double tight end sets. Yeah. I would expect that trend to continue. By the way, especially Sweat, this Sweat is opposite the Giants left tackle. Yeah, and Sweat is a good player. He's a good edge rusher. Had a slow start this year, though. Yeah, but overall, he's definitely a good yep. good center, uh, good edge rusher. So I fully expect Manhurts and Theo Johnson both to be on the field plenty on Sunday, and a lot of it will be them helping with the blocks. All right, let's go back to the phones. Roy from Charleston. You're next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. How you doing, Paulie? Hi. Hey, Matt. Hey, what's so, going on? Uh, good, guys. You know, uh, Paul, I uh, I talked to you a couple of weeks ago, and I know you talked to so many people. My breakout player was Ojalari. Mm-hmm. And so, like you just said, he's hopefully going to be on that right side, and Barkley's going to just run right into his arms. He. Ojalari has really stepped it up, and I'm really happy about that. And, you know, with McFadden and Okereke, I think you got a triple threat there to really be able, hopefully, to hold off Barkley doing running on the, red, on the right side like you were talking about. As long as Ojalari plays stout, they'll be fine because he's got the pass rush skills. In years past, he had some trouble recognizing the run, and he had some trouble with holding his ground because of a lack of power. He has gotten bigger and stronger over the years, and he's gotten much better in his play recognition. I thought he played the best game of his Giants career last week. I thought so, too. I thought he was good. Well, in the last two games, he, I thought he really did well. Last mm-hmm. week, he really did well. So we've got to pay attention to playing above the X's and O's, execution. Got to execute. And I'm still a big Daniel fan, and Daniel's just got to stop these bonehead plays. I mean, oh, he's killing me. <laughs> well, and like you said last week, you know, like you said, at, I think you said maybe Monday, you know, Eli would have just upped it and, and, and went for the sack. Yeah, he would have eaten the you ball, know? no doubt. And, and and Daniel is built enough, he can he can do that. I mean, my gosh, he runs for his life and he, and he, he puts his shoulder into the defensive guy who's trying to tackle him, mm-hmm. so you know he can He's not a. Uh, he doesn't need to be afraid of taking a sack. Like you said, Matt, you said it. Live another day. You know, live another day. I mean, you know, you know if yeah. it's a second down and he takes a sack, hey, you got two more downs to make it up. So yep. I'm hoping that Daniel will really be able to just kind of not be afraid of. And, and I think, you know, Daniel is really. I know this is a show-me year for him. Uh, you know, he's trying to recover from the injury. He's trying to do his very best to put the team on his shoulder. I just want him to know he doesn't have to put the team on his shoulder. That's why it's a team. And so I'm really hoping that, that you know, Darius Slayton will be able to, between Slayton, Robinson, um, Malik, I mean, you know, and, and – um, um, uh, you know, Theo and and, uh, and Bellinger. You know, I mean, we've got some serious good weapons that he can just Roy, utilize. Let, 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 me, let me add this just, to you, Roy. The Eagles only have 11 sacks. Their pass rush has not been what it's been the last half a dozen years. It is It has been muted. Now, the good news is, and I like Matt's idea, you know, if you're going to, give a little help with the tight end it's probably going to be on the left tackle side (laughs) let's not kid ourselves that's that's pretty elementary right right? right. you could you could also go double tight end play like you're going to go big and play a heavy formation and then run at least one of those tight ends on a pass route now if by some stretch of the imagination you show that you can hold up early in the game with your pass pro there's nothing wrong with throwing four or five balls to Theo Johnson and getting them out in pass routes if those five guys up front prove early that they can hold up because now that's another weapon down the field. 
You know? And I'll give you one other item, Roy. And this is, I love why you said execution. You know why? I want to give you two numbers. And I want you to keep these two numbers in mind as you watch the game on Sunday because I hope they do not come into play. The Giants lead the National Football League in drop passes with 18. The Philadelphia Eagles have the fewest drop passes in the NFL. They have two. 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 And you know who dropped the two? Barkley dropped one and Goddard dropped one, which by definition tells you that their wide receivers as a whole have zero dropped passes. I don't think you want to relive all the drop passes that the Giants have given Daniel Jones this year, do you? Imagine, imagine that. If Daniel Jones had a bunch of teammates that only had two drop passes right now, this team would be four and two or five and one. No question about it. No question. But Jalen Hurts is the beneficiary of that. Two drop passes by the entire Eagles team after five games. Well, we got to execute. I, you know, I, absolutely, we got to concentrate. We got to have sticky hands. So, all right, Roy, really appreciate glue. it. All right, enjoy the game. Thank you. Two zero one nine three nine four five one three. I think if the Giants can show in the first half that they don't need the extra tight end help, whether it be as a blocker or a chipper you'll see them maybe try to open that up and send the tight end downfield in the second half. I really think that that would be a tremendous benefit for this team. Yeah, I think so too. And a a reason why I agree with you on that is because these last two weeks with Malik Neighbor sidelined, we've seen Theo Johnson sort of step up as a receiver. I mean, I I know I mentioned he's top three in tight ends and pass blocking snaps, but the last two weeks he has eight targets. He's caught all eight of them. For 78 mm-hmm. yards. Now, are those draw-dropping numbers? No. But for a rookie tight end, a rookie fourth-round pick tight end, those are solid numbers, you know, a couple of weeks into his NFL career. And it's a big improvement from what we saw from him the first few weeks of the season. The first, Week one, he had four targets. He caught one of them. Wasn't targeted in week two. And then week three, was targeted three times. He caught one of them. And I'm pretty sure each of those... Week one and week three, he had at least one drop, I'm pretty sure. I could tell you exactly. I got him for one drop against Minnesota and one drop against Cleveland. Yeah, so the fact that the last two weeks he's caught all eight targets thrown his way, I think that's showing that he's already starting to grow a little bit as a pass catcher, which even when the Giants drafted him going into this season, we all we said, I don't want to call him like a – developmental project but he was sort of a raw prospect that was going to need some growth and development and we're only six weeks into his career and we're starting to see that growth and development well he caught the ball really well during the summer he did but then when the game started we saw something different but it's nice to see him go back getting back to now what we saw on a nearly daily basis over the summer Mm -hmm. he's proving that he can be a reliable target in the passing game for daniel jones and if he can continue to grow and continue to become even a better and better pass catcher, then that's going to help this offense take the next step in the passing game in particular. And the one other thing I just wanted to point out that Roy mentioned at the beginning of his call with Daniel Jones and you know the, the interception against the Bengals, I don't think that that was Daniel Jones, you know, a, a trying to like not necessarily like he was trying to avoid the sack. Yes. It's not that he was afraid to or like not willing to take a hit because obviously he still got hit. I think it was Daniel Jones trying to do too much. He was trying to throw the ball away, and I'm pretty sure he said he was trying to throw yes. the ball out of the back well, of the end zone. I don't think zone. Roy accused him from from wimping out. Well, he said that he was like he afraid him. to take a sack, and because he mentioned that Daniel, you know, well, because he lowered, wanted, but he, he wanted mentioned to throw the ball away. I know, but he mentioned that Daniel was like lowering his shoulder as a runner into defenders, which He's made tough. it seem like he is. But it just made it seem like he was saying like that he was trying to so kind of avoid getting hit in contact. I didn't sense that. I mean, but you it, could uh, if that was the interpretation. That's I, fine. That's just, just I what didn't I see got. it that all, way. All I'm trying to say is that, as you know, as Roy even mentioned, Daniel Jones has lowered his shoulder into defenders oh, yeah. throughout He's the tough. season. He's, He's not afraid of contact. He sometimes just, too tough for his own. Sometimes good. needs to 
do a little less. He needs to, as you and Roy both mentioned, not try to put the team on his back every single play. Live to live to play another play. And yeah, look, I would say we have seen him do that a little bit or at times this season. It hasn't been every single game he's been doing that. It's been little flashes of it. So hopefully as he continues to get, you know, further along, further removed from last year's injury, more just comfortable back on the field that we start to see him, you know, try to do too much, a little bit less and less. All right. I've got basically two numbers that I'm going to throw out at you as two keys to the game. I'll let you do the same and then we'll sign out of here. Very simply put, if I'm the Giants, I want to see them have fewer drop passes than the Eagles on Sunday. To me, that is a huge key because everything that Jalen Hurts has had in the passing game, Daniel Jones has not had because his teammates have let him down. The second thing that I think is huge is that the Giants need to have a higher red zone efficiency than the Eagles. Both teams right now are at 44%, tied for 25th worst, uh, 25th in the NFL, which is in the bottom third quadrant. Can you believe that, right? Eagles and Giants, both at 44% red zone efficiency. Somehow people aren't crying for, Dan- uh, for J- Jalen Hurts to be thrown into the river. Somehow, he's avoiding a lot of this stuff, but this quarterback here, everybody wants to get after him. Well, we're talking about the same red zone efficiency for both teams right now, 44%, and it's not good. So win the battle of red zone efficiency and have fewer drop passes. And I'll throw in one other kind of off-the-charts kind of number. Have fewer penalties and penalty yardage than the Eagles. I bet you if they do those three things, they win the game. Yeah, for me, the biggest key, and you you touched on it, is how both teams perform in the red zone. You mentioned that they both have a 44.4% red zone efficiency. Both teams have scored touchdowns on 8 of 18 trips inside the red zone. For both teams, that's just not good enough. You want that number to be better. Their field goal kicker is really good. And the Giants have been very inconsistent on field goals. Yes, Jake Elliott is a good kicker. So, obviously, on offense, I think whoever, whichever team can be more efficient and get the ball into the end zone rather than have to settle for field goals, that will go a long way. And on the flip side, which defense can hold the opponent outside the red zone? We talked about the red zone offenses. Well, these have been two of the best red zone defenses in the NFL. The Giants currently rank fifth in red zone defense. The Eagles are right ahead of them at number four, the fourth best red zone defense. So, which offense can get into the end zone and which defense can hold the opponent from putting a six and hold them to a three instead i think that was gonna that is gonna be the biggest deciding factor of who comes out with the victory in this big divisional matchup all right that'll do it for today's edition of big blue kickoff live presented by cadillac the official luxury vehicle of the new york football giants we are here every monday to friday 12 30 p.m eastern time live for one hour 201-939-4513 Write down the number. We will be on WFAN with the pregame show at 11 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. Kickoff is at 1. Two-hour postgame on FAN following. And, of course, MSG with the Giants postgame live. One-hour show immediately following the game on MSG Networks. For Matt Sitek, I'm Paul Dottino. We'll see you next time.